Let's pray together. Lord, we are so thankful for the privilege of gathering here this morning. Lord, we have come to you singing songs of praise to you for who you are and what you have done. Uh, you are a God who has demonstrated your love to us, to us Lord. You are um, a God who sent your son, Jesus, to suffer and endure the afflictions of this world, in particular the cross, so that by his sacrifice we could be reconciled to you. And this morning, Lord, we want you to speak to us. We want to hear from you. We want your word to impact our hearts and challenge us so that we can not only grasp who we are in you, but, Lord, we can have a greater understanding of what you've called us to um, as far as living for your glory. And help me now as simply your messenger that I would be faithful to reflect your truth and to impact that on the hearts of the people that are here. Thank you, Lord. And we, we just trust now that you're going to have your way with us in your precious name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As uh, has been mentioned already this morning, um, this week is actually considered Reformation Week. And uh, most churches celebrated Reformation Sunday last week. Um, we just kind of felt like it was closer to the actual date by doing it today. And uh, so we want to just focus a little bit on that as we prepare our time for our text this morning because it all connects. Um, this is not so much a, a week of celebration or a day of celebration. This is really a, a week of remembrance, in particular, of men and women who were courageous, who stood against the false teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, seeing clearly that it, it didn't reflect the true teachings of Scripture. So the, the Reformation was not just some kind of a revolt for political reasons. There was substance to what ha happened and the reason why there was a change in the church. Now, typically, the beginning of the Reformation um, is attributed to a man by the name of Martin Luther. He was an Augustinian monk. And uh, one of the things that he was doing within the context of the Catholic Church is he was reading the Word of God, in particular, the Book of Romans. And he came to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. This is what it says. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, talking about the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, for faith, as it is written, that the righteous shall live by faith. Now, friends, that was a very impactful passage of scripture for him because in the context of the church at that point in time, what we consider and call the Roman Catholic Church, there was this kind of marrying of works as well as faith in order to get to God. You had the tradition of the church that ultimately said you can do your good works and there was, of course, faith in the midst of all that, but it was Based, based on your efforts, based on your works, and you might actually get to a place called purgatory, which you'd have to get yourself out of eventually. And as Luther was reading this passage, the just or the righteous shall live by faith, it unsettled him. And it caused him to rethink what was going on. Of course, the context at that point in time was he was just in the church. He's just studying the word of God, and here's what it says. So consumed by what he was reading and comparing it to what the Roman Catholic Church was teaching, he began to see that much of the theology and the practice of the church at that time did not match the teaching of Scripture. And in Roman Catholic teaching, the teachings of the church, what are considered to be tradition, were more authoritative than the teaching of Scripture. Now, we see that in today's context. We see that in today's context because there is a new pope, Pope Francis, and this new pope is actually a more liberal pope, I want to say politically speaking, but even religiously. And there are many conservative Catholics that are really concerned because of his liberal leanings and tendencies, especially with the things like the homosexual agenda and the gay and lesbian agenda and other things that are going on, even climate change and that kind of stuff. And so he is actually charting a course that is different from where the Catholic Church has been heading. And as Pope, if he speaks something authoritatively, it is. Whether Scripture is, says something contrary to it or not, the teachings of the church 
contradict, or I should say, overstep the teachings of the Word of God. So it wasn't long, however, before young Martin Luther sought to challenge the church. And as was mentioned earlier today, on October 31st, 1517, he posted, posted these 95 theses against the Roman Catholic practice of selling indulgences on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. Now, there weren't like 95 separate theses, okay? It was like a big document with 95 arguments as to why these indulgences did not fall in line with Scripture. Now, what's an indulgence? In the Catholic context, someone might work their way, so to speak, to try and get to heaven, but ultimately, um, they were taken to a place after they died called purgatory. And while they were in purgatory, they had to work off their sin, and they could also be helped by the prayers of the church to help them to get out of purgatory and into heaven. And so what the church had done is they created a system that you could actually pay the church so that the priests or the monks could pray for that departed loved one who was in purgatory so that they could get out of purgatory faster. You can see how this little scam was working, right? And so the church was taking all this money, and if you, if you don't give this, then these people, your loved ones are going to be in purgatory for so long, and you don't want that, do you? All right? So there was this... There's this really horrible, unbiblical teaching that was going on. And so the 95 Theses challenged that. And so uh, this bold act by a monk with a, a mallet launched what is now known as the Protestant Reformation. And I want you to think, um, okay, we have technical difficulties here. I want you to think about what Philip Schaff says um, in his book, The History of the Christian Church. He says, the Reformation of the 16th century is, next to the introduction of Christianity, the greatest event in history. It marks the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of modern times. Starting from religion, it gave directly and indirectly a mighty impulse to every forward movement and made Protestantism the chief propelling force in the history of modern civilization. This is a significant event in the history of the world, in particular in the history of the church. Now, some of the early reformers who followed Martin Luther or who lived during the same times are men like this, Ulrich Zwingli, Hugh Latimer, William Tyndale, Martin Melanchthon, John Rogers, Heinrich Bollinger, and, of course, the well-known John Calvin. These were all men prepared by God for their time in history. They were... Godly men, not perfect, but godly, educated men, courageous men. And as the historian Stephen Nichols says, the reformers did not see themselves as inventors, discoverers, or creators. Instead, they saw their efforts as rediscovery. They weren't making something from scratch, but were reviving what had become dead. They looked back to the Bible and to the apostolic era, as well as to the early church fathers, such as Augustine, for the mold by which they could shape the church and reform it. Now, there's a saying uh, from those reformers, and still is a saying today, Ecclesia Reformata Semper Reformanda, which means the church reformed, always reforming. In other words, as a church, we should always be looking at what we say and what we believe and checking to make sure that it's right, because it's natural for us, because of our sin, to drift away. So we always have to be reforming. We always have to be going back to the basics. We're going to celebrate the Lord's table today. Part of the reason we celebrate communion is because we want to go back to the basics. We want to get back to the, the core reality of what it means to be a child of God by virtue of what Jesus Christ has done. The Reformation was, at its heart, a recovery of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And this restoration had an unparalleled influence on churches, on nations, and the flow of Western civilization. So this is a huge impactful event in history. Now, the reality is most of the churches that are not, for example, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, all of those are in a stream um, that would be consistent with, might want to say, Roman Catholic teaching, although there was some break um, before that. 
Um, if they're not one of those, they typically are going to be Protestant churches. And they're the fruit of the Reformation. Let me just give you some different denominations to help you understand this, okay? Presbyterianism, Methodism, Baptists, Christian Reformed, Christian and Missionary Alliance, Bible Churches, Wesleyan, Anglican, Episcopalian, that's just to name a few. All those are part of the stream of what is called the Reformation. Now, there's certainly some differences in theology and ideas among those different denominations, but they exist as a result of the effects and the fruit of the Reformation. This is no small event in history. In fact, um, I'd say most of the so-called non-denominational churches are Protestant. I say so-called because every non-denominational church has a theological base to it. Okay? They have some idea. They have some backing that they are following. But the sad reality, friends, is this. Much of what the Protestant Reformation recovered, stood for, and died restoring is being lost or neglected by the modern Protestant church. In fact, to a large degree, most of today's Protestant church wouldn't know what the church protested against. If you went into your average church, average Protestant church in here in the United States, and you said, why did the Reformation happen? What were the key ingredients or the key issues? I, I would think that most people would not know the answer to that question. And that's evident because in today's Christian culture, there is a move toward removing the distinction between the Protestant church and the Roman Catholic church, which is impossible. From the Roman Catholic side, we are anathema. That has not changed. That means devoted to destruction. That's what the Catholic church believes about us. Now, this is why it's good to remember what are called the five solas or five slogans of the Reformation, okay? The first one, of course, sola scriptura, which simply means scripture alone. And it's speaking to the issue here of it's not scripture and the church or the traditions. It's scripture alone. And certainly the church then has to submit to the teachings of scripture. There is Christ alone. In other words, Mary or other saints do not supersede Christ. They don't take on the same level as him. He is our mediator. There is no other. All right? By grace alone versus works. That's what Matt was reading there in Ephesians chapter 2. That's why Paul said that. He's making a distinction there between this, this wonderful grace that we have received by faith as opposed to works that we offer trying to impress God. We cannot impress God. By faith alone. Again, this, this is entangled with works. It's by faith alone. And then for the glory of God alone. Now those are five series of messages in and of themselves, right? That's, that's not the point here. But just to identify, these are the five slogans significantly important that came out of the Reformation. And as you go into various churches um, that are that are holding fast to those principles, you will see those posted usually somewhere in their church because they want to remember these five solas. Now, it's a good thing to remember that the, the Reformation was also marked by what we have been seeing already in 2 Timothy. For example, standing on the gospel and Christ's teaching without being ashamed. Suffering hardship and enduring difficult trials. Many of the reformers were martyred for their faith and their unwillingness to embrace the Roman Catholic teaching. It's also marked by looking forward to Christ and the prospect of heaven, the prospect of glory. And I'm sure that for most of the reformers, Paul's second and final letter to Timothy was a source of great encouragement. Because in that letter, we find counsel to face opposition in so many different places. And so the reformers, they, they knew what it meant to endure suffering for the sake of the gospel. They lived out facing the temptation to turn away from Christ, to turn away from the true gospel and God's faithful messengers, which we looked at a couple of weeks ago, because their lives and the lives of their loved ones were in jeopardy. Because if they're standing for the truth, 
then they would, let's say the church at that point in time, would get to them through their families. And they, ha- they understood what it was to endure. They understood what it was to suffer. They understood also what it meant to be a courageous Christian. And when you read the stories of so many of these reformers, you realize these were great men and women of strength and character and godliness and courage. So now as we come to our text today, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 8 through 13, we, we realize that the reformers really reflect what is being talked about here. Because Paul wants Timothy and us to understand something. And here is Here is the the theme for this section. Suffering and glory are the essential essence of not being ashamed. Now, we're going to tease this out, and we're going to see it a lot as we go through this passage. But let's just talk a little bit about suffering and glory. Paul has just finished drawing our attention to three illustrations. He gives us one basic illustration, which J.D. fleshed out last week, that there is this soldier, and and he's calling Timothy to be this this faithful soldier, but then there are these three illustrations that support that. And the soldier and the farmer and the athlete, all of them suffered and endured with a goal in mind. Think about this. The soldier maintained a single focus so that he could listen to the commands of his superior And so win the battle. The goal was to win the battle by being obedient to his superior. The athlete disciplined himself so that he competes according to the rules and so receives a crown. The goal was to receive a crown. The farmer works hard so that he can reap a healthy harvest. So in each case, single-mindedness, careful discipline, and hard work are the means to reaching the goal. So apply that to the Christian life. Suffering and endurance are the means to reaching the prize of eternal glory. So those who take not being ashamed seriously live with the perspective and the understanding that we are called to suffering now with a promise of glory to come. See, we're called to suffering and endurance now with the promise of glory to come. Now, when we get that mixed up, we're likely to be susceptible to being ashamed of the gospel. And this is, this is a smack against what is called the prosperity gospel. It's so prevalent today. You can go into lots of churches, even in our area, that preach and teach a prosperity gospel. It is the teaching that comes through what is known as the the Word Faith Movement, whose well-known teachers are people like Joel Osteen and Kenneth Hagin and Paula White and T.D. Jakes and Joyce Meyer, just to name a few. The prosperity gospel teaches glory now without suffering now. They want the glory now rather than what Scripture says, the glory is yet to come. It teaches that sickness, disease, and poverty, and lack of progress in life are all the result of sin in your life. It says God wants you to be successful, not struggling. God wants you to be healthy, not sick. God wants you to be wealthy, not living in poverty. And the reason you're struggling is because of your lack of faith in God. You see, you should be receiving glory now. You should have victory now. You should be celebrating it now. But that's not what Scripture says. There's certainly an aspect of victory now, but that victory is ultimately fulfilled when we step into heaven. But the call for the Christian now is a call to faithfulness while you are suffering and enduring for the sake of the gospel. So a prosperity gospel teaches glory now without suffering now. And it's an attempt to say that glory is all about me rather than all about Christ. Then, of course, there's the true gospel. That would be that the scriptures are full of examples and teaching that reinforces the reality of present suffering and endurance. That lives in light of future glory. Now, by no means does that mean that Paul does not embrace joy. Joy. 
He's not saying, you know, the, the Christian life is one of, of misery and, and hardship, and I'm just going to go through life. Oh, that's not it at all. He loves joy. In fact, read the book of Philippians. One of the themes in there, it's not the only theme, the theme is fellowship, but it also includes this wonderful aspect of joy, joy that comes by virtue of your relationship with Christ that is fleshed out amidst a community of believers. So this isn't just some kind of a, you know, humdrum kind of, uh, I hate life, boredom kind of a Christianity, but it is a recognition that Being a follower of Christ means that we're going to suffer and endure. And the prize that we long for is not here and now. It is yet to come. Now, there's also this idea of remember. If you look at the first verse there, um, in verse 8, it says remember. Now, oftentimes when we're talking about remembering, we're not just thinking about remembering for the sake of remembering. Oh, this happened in the past. Biblical remembrance here means that we're going back to the truths of the Bible and therefore living in light of them today. So we look back at the past, we're saying, okay, here's an example that I need to follow now. Here's a truth that I need to embrace that is demonstrated for me back in the past, and that's going to fuel me to live today. To put it another way, our strength to stand for Jesus Christ today is rooted in history. So we don't just, you know, think about the Reformation as an historical fact, It is, but it is also something that fuels our present reality. We look back to remind ourselves of what God is calling us to so that we can push on and do what he desires for us to do today. So remember the past for the purpose of living faithfully today. So in order to do all that and to embrace this passage, Paul wants Timothy and us to reflect and to remember three arenas, the gospel Christian ministry, and the Christian life. And he kind of lays it out that way in this passage. And he says, first of all, remember the example of Jesus Christ. Remember the example of Jesus Christ. Suffering and glory are the essence of the gospel. With the example of Christ, we see that suffering and glory are the essence of the gospel. Let me, let me flesh this out for you, verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. So this idea of risen from the dead and the offspring of David actually correspond to the title given here, Jesus in Christ. Jesus, first of all, we see, is risen from the dead. He's risen from the dead. All right. Excuse me, could someone get me another battery here? I think we're down on this. All right. He's risen from the dead. The name Jesus is his human name given at birth. And this Jesus came into this earth knowing that he would suffer. And knowing that he would suffer at the hands of the religious leaders and ultimately he would be crucified. If you study Mark's gospel three times, Jesus says to his disciples, this is what's going to happen to me. I'm going to read you the last one. It's found in chapter 10 and verse 33 and 34. This is what he says to his disciples. See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man, talking about himself, will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. Jesus Christ, or Jesus, risen from the dead. So he suffered under the Jewish religious leadership and was ultimately put to death by crucifixion. But Jesus also knew that he would rise again after three days. So that's what's known as the resurrection. The resurrection would become the cornerstone of the preaching of the early church, and it continues to be the cornerstone of the preaching today. We sang songs today that include the resurrection. We sing songs today that point to Jesus Christ dying on the cross. But the resurrection is key, and it is the punchline of the gospel. Now, certainly good men had suffered in history under the Romans for various causes. But Jesus suffered at both the hands of man and under the wrath of the Father. He died but the difference is that he rose again. 
See, it's so significant that we realize this historical reality. Without the resurrection, the Christian message is emptied of its essential content. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. So now, what Paul says is that Jesus is risen from the dead. And the word risen here is important to understand. A little bit of Greek won't hurt you. It's in the perfect tense that conveys this idea, a completed action that has ongoing results. In other words... What Paul is saying is Jesus is risen from the dead and still is risen, okay? A completed action that has ongoing results. It wasn't just, oh, he rose from the dead and that's it. No, there is lingering impact on what Jesus did through his resurrection that has bearing today. He still is. So not only is the resurrection an historical fact, it's a present reality. And we can say that there are three things that the resurrection did. Just quickly, it proved the gospel message to be true. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. What's Paul saying? The reason I can preach is because the resurrection did happen. It also demonstrated the gospel's power for living in Christ. This is a reflection on Romans 6, 4. We are buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. We celebrate baptism. This is is where we get this picture from. A person goes down under the water as a symbol of his death in Christ. And then he comes up out of the water as a reflection of what we read here in the end of Romans 6, 4. So that we too might walk in newness of life. The resurrection brings now the power to live in Christ today. But the resurrection also assures believers of their promised bodily resurrection yet to come. But in fact, has Christ has been, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For by as one man came death, by a man has, has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So as we remember Jesus risen from the dead, we are reassured of God's powerful gospel that saves us, that sanctifies us, and promises us a glorification in heaven. My friends, that's, that's a powerful reality. And Paul is saying, this is my gospel, but it's the first part. Jesus, risen from the dead. And then, of course, there's Christ. There's Christ who is the offspring of David. Now, isn't it interesting? We just got done with going through 1 Samuel. So if you were here during 1 Samuel, you read this little section, you're like, aha, ding, should be a little flag going off. Saying, okay, wait a second here, there's something going on. Because remember in 1 Samuel, the problem was there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And and God steps into that, that kind of emptiness and he brings Samuel onto the scene. And Samuel is there to prepare the way for God's king. But the people wanted their king. And so God allowed them to choose Saul. And Saul proved to be a failure. But God was already in his his works, preparing David to be his king. And as we get into 2 Samuel, which we'll do come January, we will see that David is then made king, but David himself is not the ultimate focus because David foreshadows the king of kings, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. So the word Christ here, the title Christ, is talking about the Messiah. That's what it means. So the one who was called Jesus, who suffered, died, and rose again, is also the king who reigns in heaven. He is the culmination of the plan of the Godhead. And we're all called to bow down before him and worship him as king. Now the emphasis that Paul is making here is this. The reign of Jesus Christ as king took place by traveling the road of humility, suffering, and death. He's using Jesus here as an illustration to prove his point. 
In other words, glory was achieved through suffering and endurance for Christ. Suffering was a necessary precursor to glory. Or to put it another way, Jesus Christ lived a human earthly life with all of its struggles and pressures. He therefore knows and understands our suffering, our humanity, and our pressures. And that's why the writer of Hebrews summarizes this in Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest, talking about Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Why? Because he suffered. He endured. But he always had heaven in mind. You see, Jesus Christ is the best example of suffering that leads to glory. He is the one who endured suffering as a good soldier. He is the perfect single-minded soldier. He is the perfect disciplined athlete. He is the perfect hard-working farmer. He knew what he came to earth to do, and he was determined to do it for the glory of the Godhead. And so Paul is saying to Timothy, he's saying to Rod, he's saying to Gateway family, God's way is suffering and endurance, and then glory. Now, having said that, we move now to the example of Paul. The example of Paul. And here we have suffering and glory that is the essence of gospel ministry. Paul is not Christ, but he is one who carries out the gospel, he says, my gospel, of Jesus Christ. Now, theological grounds for suffering were more than simply theory for Paul. He had experienced a wide variety of suffering and had endured many difficulties and trials on many occasions. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 27. Give us a catalog of that. Just listen as I read. Labors, imprisonments, countless beatings that often led um, him to near death. Five times, he says, I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangerous from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And we've got some sniffles going on. But Paul is emphasizing here the reality of suffering and endurance that is necessary for gospel ministry or for Christian ministry. So Paul is reflecting on his gospel. In other words, the gospel that he experienced, that he preached, that he labored to proclaim among the churches and with his fellow laborers. He says, this is my gospel, verse 9, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure Everything for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So what were the components of gospel ministry that Paul wants us to remember? The first one is this. The struggle that God calls us to. So he's just reflecting on on himself. Paul was not writing this letter... um, He was writing this letter from humiliating circumstances, if you remember... Not only was Paul being treated as a common criminal, but he was in this jail in chains. And this idea of this word criminal, I mean, this is a word that is used to describe someone who commits violent crimes. Murderers, thieves, traitors. And they were punished by torture. So we just think of the context that Paul is in, and he's able even to get a letter out like this. So that is what chains is referring to and and referencing. It's pointing to the fact that Paul had certainly suffered in many ways, but he was also suffering now. And friends, just, just hear this. Isn't it incredibly amazing that around the world there are Christians who are in jail simply for proclaiming the gospel? That's the crime they've committed. 
I mean, they haven't murdered anyone. There's no rape. There's no stealing. It's just the fact that they are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet they're put in jail. They're treated as a criminal. And who knows exactly what's going on as far as how they are treated in those contexts. It's worth noting that Paul is writing this letter to Timothy in the context of Nero's um, empire. Of course, he blamed the Christians for fire that took place in Rome and gathered them together for, per- for persecution, in particular for executions, primarily by lions in the grand arenas. So Paul is the leader of these Christians in Rome. This is suffering. This is endurance. Paul knew the God he was serving. That's what he says earlier in chapter 2. He's convinced that God was able to keep working through him until God chose to remove him from this earth. So Paul was aware that he may be bound in chains, but get this, but the word of God was not. What a great picture. What a great perspective to have when you're in the middle of of gospel suffering. You may be in chains. You may be in jail. But that doesn't stop the gospel from doing what it does. What a promise Paul is proclaiming about God's word. So that leads us then to not only the struggle that God calls us to, but the power God is committed to. The word of God is not bound. I remember as a youth pastor, I I read this This newsletter, I was reminded of it this week as I was studying for this passage because one of the commentators mentioned it, but it's a story that just to me is very impactful in particular because I've been to Russia a few times. But there's an organization called Commission. This is written by a lady by the name of Andrea Wolf, and she's just talking about the experience that they had there. They were going into Russia, and they were trying to bring Bibles into a particular city, and they were having difficulty doing that. And someone, a Russian, said, well, there's a warehouse over here where they used to take things that they were, you know, they took from people who were Christians and stuff like that. And they went to this warehouse, and it was full of Bibles. And so they hired just people to come, in particular guys, usually college-age guys, to come and just be a day laborer for that day to come and to help them gather these Bibles and put them in trucks and take them where they needed to go. And there was one young man in particular he was a, a, a college student, and he was just hired for the day, and he was a, a skeptic, um, you know, certainly a, a reflection of the culture of Russia at that point in time, and as he was in there, he disappeared, and they found him off in the corner weeping, and in his hand was a Bible, and he showed them the Bible, and in that Bible, in the fly of that Bible, was his grandmother's name whom he knew had prayed for him for years. Okay. Now, God is an incredible God in his providence and his sovereignty to bring about a situation like that, but it's evidence of the fact you can try and stamp out the gospel, but you can never, ever do it. Because the word of God is not bound. The word you have in your hand is a powerful thing. It is a powerful Word, a breath of God to mankind, it is not something that man can ever stomp out. It will always find its way. And that's why even in countries where Christianity is even outlawed, there are Christians who are opening up the word in quietness, in private, in secret. So in the midst of suffering gospel ministry, is this powerful word of God. It is the gospel. It stirs hearts. It convicts sinners. It calls the elect. It strengthens the body of Christ. And so this word of God is that gospel. It's what Paul preached. It's what Paul entrusted to Timothy to entrust to faithful men. It's what Paul guarded and was calling Timothy to guard. It's what Paul explained as he laid down the pattern of sound teaching that Timothy was to follow It's what Paul called Timothy to think on. The word of God, the gospel is not bound. Get what Paul is saying here to Timothy and to us. God's people can be put away 
or killed, but his word cannot be stopped. He is the source of his word, the gospel. It is his loving communication to this world to imprison or kill the word of God would require imprisoning or killing God himself. And the irony, friends, is that the history of the church shows that the efforts of the enemy to halt the spread of the gospel only caused the church to grow. This is what Paul says in Philippians 1, verses 12 and 14. Just listen. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Verse 14. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Can't chain the word of God. So this this gospel ministry unfolds with these promises, with these encouragements, the struggle God calls us to, the power of God, or power God is committed to, and finally here, the hope God leads us to. The hope God leads us to. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul suffered and endured in his gospel ministry for the sake of those whom God chose before the ages begin. The message of the gospel preached through suffering and endurance was the necessary means that God had established so that the elect might obtain salvation and ultimately heaven. So gospel ministry is marked by suffering and endurance that has as its focus the salvation of God's elect and the promise of eternal glory. So here are these themes again. Suffering and endurance, eternal glory. Now in the context of Christian ministry. And friends, that is quite a motivation for any person who preaches, teaches, shares the gospel, for pastors, for teachers, for parents, for Christians who believe in sharing the gospel. This is faithful counsel, friends. This word that you have is unleashed by your proclamation of it. And by virtue of that proclamation, God is using that means to draw his elect to himself and to usher them into heaven. It's quite a beautiful picture. It's a powerful reality. Sadly, however, much of the American Christian church is more concerned about being comfortable, safe, prosperous. We tend to turn to God so that he can remove obstacles, he can remove suffering, he can remove affliction, We want him to comfort us. And so we pray things like this. Comfort me, Lord, and pay my bills. Comfort me, Lord, and cure my ills. Comfort me, Lord, remove my fears. Comfort me, Lord, and dry my tears. Comfort me, Lord, increase my wealth. Comfort me, Lord, preserve my health. Comfort me, Lord, and plead my case. Comfort me, Lord, and enlarge my place. Comfort me, Lord, tell me why. Comfort me, Lord, and set me on high. Comfort me, Lord, do what I say. Comfort me, Lord, do it today. The Spirit listened as I uttered my mind. He said not a word as I pleaded and pined. And then he spoke in the language of conviction, saying, Comfort isn't comfort in the absence of affliction. See, we want the comfort, but we don't want the affliction. We want the the joys without the suffering. We want a Pollyanna-ish kind of Christianity that won't speak the truth, won't cause any confrontation. We just want to be nice. But friends, gospel ministry involves suffering and endurance. But that is the means, that is the road by which we get to glory. That's the road by which those that we minister to get to glory. So it's important that we hear what Paul is saying to Timothy and us. Suffering and endurance is worth the prize of people's salvation and their joyous entrance into heaven. 
When I think of suffering in the ministry for the sake of the elect, there's a number of stories I think of, but two that come to mind that I think may be helpful for us here. The first one is the whole story of Jim Elliott and the Aqua Indians. Here are these five missionaries and their wives and their families going off to Ecuador with a plane, planning out their desire to reach these, these jungle peoples, And so they get there, they prepare, they live in the area for a while, they anticipate the day, they're excited, they're praying, they're rejoicing over the opportunity, they do some flyovers, and finally they see this beach that they can land on, the five guys are in the plane, they land on the beach, they get there, and the first day they're able to interact with a couple of ladies, they're there for like five days, on the sixth day, these two ladies come out of the woods to meet them. And so they're like, oh, this is, this is great. Maybe there's something that's going to happen here. And as they're walking across the river to these ladies, the men of this, this tribe come with spears and all dressed up in their battle regalia, and they spear these five men to death. All of them had guns. But they had committed to one another that if their lives were in danger by these people, they would not use them to protect themselves from the possibility of death. See, there's an example of suffering and endurance for the sake of the gospel because what happened next is the rest of the story. With the five men dead, and of course, if you were around during that time or aware of it, you heard it on the news, but two of the wives and one of the daughters, Jim Elliott's daughter, um, began to make inroads to these villages. And two years later, they're actually living in this very same village. And as a result of that, there were people that were turning to Christ in the context of those villages. The point there is, glory for these people groups came as a result of suffering and endurance. Another one, a little different, considerably different, um, is in the life of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. You may know him. He's often called the Prince of Preachers. But when he was 22 years old, um, he almost quit the ministry. Now, you have to understand, at 22 years old, um, Spurgeon was a very, very popular preacher. In fact, almost every week or a couple times a week, there were disparaging articles in the newspapers about him, what he taught on Sunday, and what he was saying. So much so that his wife would not allow him to read the newspaper. She would catch it before, he, before it came in, and she would read it, and if there was anything bad, she would remove it because she didn't want to discourage her husband. So at 22, it's just hard to imagine, isn't it? 22. And, and, and it was not too long after that, October 19th, 1856, um, that he would suffer in a way that would, be, that would affect his ministry until he was called home to be with the Lord. Because of his popularity he was forced to rent a facility called Surrey Garden Music Hall. And it held about 12,000 people. But there were so many people that wanted to come in that there were about 10,000 people outside the doors hoping to hear this Prince of Preachers preach. And as he began to preach, someone in the crowd yelled out, Fire! The galleries are giving way. The place is falling. And all of a sudden, there is pandemonium. People trying to get to the exits. And because of the crowds outside, people couldn't get out. And people were stampeded. At the end of the day, seven people died. 28 people were seriously injured. And Spurgeon spiraled into depression that lasted for over a week. And he would reflect even the sight of the Bible brought, me, uh, brought from me a flood of tears and utter distraction of mind. You see, he felt the guilt of being the cause of the gathering of all these people that resulted in this devastating stampede. In fact, as, as he would continue on later in his life, he says this, I have gone to the very bottoms of the mountains. As some of you know, in a night that never can be erased from my memory. But as far as my witness goes, I can say that the Lord is able to save unto the uttermost and in the last extremity, 
as he has been good to me. Now, that's a different kind of suffering. It's a different kind of struggle. And friends, if we're going to be faithful in gospel ministry, it means that we're going to have to kind of step out. It means that we're going to have to suffer a little bit. We're going to, have to, be, we're going to risk a little bit. Maybe I shouldn't say something or maybe I should say something. And obviously, we don't want to say things inappropriately or at the wrong time or in the wrong place. But sometimes, we just need to open our mouths and say, yes, this is what I believe. Not only this is what I believe, but this is what the Word of God says. And that might put us in a very risky place. It might even be that someone says something about you on Facebook or even writes a letter to the editor in Castro Valley Forum or something like that. It's okay. It's okay to suffer. It's okay to endure because you have a prize already. But those people you're speaking to are destined for an eternity in hell. And so we are motivated then to get up because God proclaims his truth through means and we are the means by which he does that. And so he calls us to suffer and endure with heaven in mind. So we remember the example of Christ. We remember the example of Paul. But we also remember this trustworthy saying that Paul now gives. And what he's saying here is this, that suffering and glory are the essence of Christian living. This is a trustworthy saying. And this is probably part of a hymn or a creed that was established in the early church. It's widely accepted. And so there's this if-then form. And it draws us to consider then our lives now in relation to our lives to come. We'll just read it all and then we'll kind of parse it out. This saying is trustworthy for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Now, friends, the Christian life is not a life of ease. It was never meant to be. When Jesus Christ says, if you want to be my disciple, what? Deny yourself, take up the cross, which means embrace shame and follow me. Never supposed to be a life of ease. And if, if our message of the gospel is, hey, if you just accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, everything's going to be great. You're not packaging it and unfolding it in a right perspective. It is good, obviously, as far as your eternity is concerned, but the realities of life now may not be great because you might suffer. You might receive persecution. People might turn away from you. So it's not tiptoeing through the tulips. It's not looking for one spiritual experience or high after the next. It is a buckle-down, rubber-meets-the-road kind of living that recognizes this, that the road to glory is traveled on the highway of suffering and endurance. The road to glory is traveled on the highway of suffering and endurance. So Paul now reflects on this hymn and what we have here basically are four stanzas. We have a positive, two of them are positive, one that is negative, and one that's both, in my opinion, positive and negative. Let's just look at the, the first one here. It's death to life. And this is really talking about our conversion. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. We've read Romans 6 and verse 6, but I'll say it again. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Your conversion has set you free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. This is all a beautiful reality of what happens at our conversion. We die to self. We are raised up in Christ. Not only that, we endure and we reign. This is talking about our perseverance. If we endure, we will also reign with him. The idea of enduring here means to hold your ground during affliction. Affliction. 
and it encompasses the idea of enduring while suffering. So the prize for those who endure is that we reign with him. This is the promise of much more than simply eternal rest. You know, it's like, oh, I can't wait to get to heaven so I can, I can rest. Well, there's certainly an aspect of that. But what he's saying here is this, that if you endure, you're going to do what? You're not just going to rest. What are you going to do? You're going to reign. And what does it mean to reign? It means that you take on responsibility as a co-regent. This is not a matter of pride. We're not saying we get to heaven, it's like, well, I've got a bigger kingdom now that I'm reigning over. That's not the point here. The point here is this, that Jesus brings us into his family. It's not like, well, I bring you in, but you have to stay out there. No, he's saying, come and reign with me. This is a matter of privilege. It speaks of how much God loves us and embraces us into his family, that he entrusts us the responsibility of reigning with him. What a privilege. And then we have a negative one. We call this apostasy. If we deny him, he will also deny us. This is another echo of Jesus' powerful words in Matthew 10, 32 and 33. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. And the idea here of deny is used in a couple of different ways in the New Testament. Um, first of all, it's used of, of temporary denial. And of course, the person that comes to mind would be Peter, right, who denied Christ. But he recovered from that denial. It was a temporary denial under certain circumstances. And I think we can all relate to that. There are times, I'm sure, when, when you, have, you have acted in a shameful way. As far as your relationship with Christ is concerned. And it's a temporary denial because after that, you're consumed with what you did. And you're like, God, forgive me. It's a temporary denial. But what's happening here is a permanent denial what we call apostasy. An apostate is one who, affirm, who once affirmed Christ and his teachings, but now turns his back on them and says no to them. That's what that word deny is talking about, saying no. So an apostate is someone who had all the appearance of being a Christian. They attended church. They read their Bible. They joined with Bible study. They, they evangelized. In fact, you would not be able to tell that they were an apostate at that point in time because they weren't necessarily an apostate at that point in time. They were a professing believer, but they weren't true believers. But over time, the reality of their unconverted heart spills over. You see, we can, we can carry all the culture of the church. We can do the habits that, you might we say, Christians do and still not have a regenerated heart. That's one of the things that the book of Hebrews addresses. There are believers, there are unbelievers, and there are professing believers who are not believers. In the end, the apostate turns away from Christ and disowns him and his teaching. It wasn't that they were converted and lost their salvation. They were never converted in the first place. Now, friends, people don't like to hear that. People don't like to be challenged because, hey, you know, look at me. I'm doing all these different things in the church. But I have a God-given duty to challenge. Not in a harsh way, but in a realistic way. It's easy to have the form of following Christ, but that's all it is. And you pride yourself on the things that you have done in your heart. You're still saying, God, I want to impress you. I want to impress you. Look at how good I am. But the reality is, there's no regeneration. And friends, that's a sad reality, isn't it? To be sitting under the preaching of the word week after week, singing songs of praise, serving alongside true believers, members of the church, but not ever truly being converted. What a privilege scorn. I just, I challenge you, do some soul searching. Don't play around with this. And don't allow your pride to get in the way of coming before God and saying, God, forgive me. 
for having the form of godliness but not embracing you as my Lord and Savior. And then we have the last one here, what I'm calling faithfulness. This is both positive and negative. It says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. And there's, there's actually a debate as to exactly what's going on here. Um, there are those that say it's just negative. There are those that just say it's positive. I think there's actually a little bit of, of the two going on here. Uh, and that's not simply a, <laughs> I'm going to say a cop-out. I think there's an appropriateness to that. Just Let me just read it again. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. That's the positive side, you might want to say. Um, as God's children, there are times when we are faithless, right? God knows in our progressive sanctification that we are going to be doing what we can to pursue being like Christ, but there are going to be days when we fall flat on our face in sin. And one of the things that we hold on to is the fact that he who began a good work in you promises that he will complete what he has started, Philippians 1 says. I mean, there, there are passages like that that just help us to understand that God is faithful even though we are faithless. But I think it's also important for us to recognize the negative side to this because, listen, God, God is faithful to his promises. And if God promises that if you reject me, what is, what is he left with? His promise to fulfill what he says to those who reject him. So you go, back to the, you go back to the verse and it says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. He cannot go against his character. So if you say no to God and no to God and no to God and no to God, God doesn't say, oh, just come here, I love you. He says, no, you keep on saying no to me, then you are exercising unbelief. And there is a consequence for that. And the consequence for that is you are still in your sins. The consequence is you still are heading for an eternity in hell. You are already condemned and you still are condemned because you refuse to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because God is consistent in his character, he cannot deny his very own character. So God's judgment and justice flow out of his holy character. He cannot deny his promise to remain faithful to his children. And he cannot deny his promise to remain faithful to judge those who reject him. Suffering and endurance, friends. We've seen the example in Christ. We've seen the example in Paul. We've seen now the example laid out for us with this trustworthy saying that this is what we're called to in our Christian life. And I want us to think now about bringing this all together. I'm just going to ask some questions. And I, I need for you to be honest about this and, and to challenge yourself on this. Number one, do you believe that the word of God, the gospel, is not bound? You might say it, but do you believe it? Now listen, as a pastor, you don't want to hear about my thoughts, my opinions, my ideas, my stories, independent of the word of God. It is the word of God proclaimed that is the power. It's not the stories of Rod and his life. You understand that? My job is to be a preacher of the word, in season, out of season, to allow it to rebuke, to allow it to confront or to comfort or to challenge. It is what I preach. Now, I know that I'm a, I'm a pastor teacher, and that's not necessarily your calling, but you are called to carry the gospel. You're called to minister the gospel, whether that be in the context of your home, whether that be in the context of your greater families, whether that be in the context of, of, of work or even in church or in your community, whatever it might be, wherever God places you in your sphere of influence, you are a messenger of the gospel. You are a missionary called by him to take the gospel of the good news to those who don't believe. Do you believe the power of the gospel, that the word of God is not bound? And if you believe that, then probably you will proclaim it. You will speak it. You will find ways 
to allow it to come into conversation in an appropriate way, not something that would contradict maybe, I'm going to say, you know, standards at work and things like that, but as a relationship, just, hey, this is why I do what I do. This is how I get through the circumstance. It's the gospel. It's Jesus Christ. You're, you're just proclaiming it wherever you go. It is the worldview that you have. I mean, can your atheist neighbor, coworker, friend, be penetrated by the power of the gospel? What's the answer? Absolutely. We say it, but do our actions demonstrate that we believe it? Now, by no means am I asking you to go to your neighbor and just blast them with the gospel. What I'm saying is, trust that the gospel does work. God is working through it. And that little by little, as you speak, as you talk, as you emphasize, as you live your life in such a way to to adorn the gospel, it is at work. Number two, is there evidence of gospel suffering? Is there evidence of gospel suffering and endurance in your life? Or are you coasting, satisfied with your comfort? Now, I want to make a distinction here. A couple of weeks ago, um, I wasn't in church because I was suffering. My stomach was hurting. I was writhing in pain for a couple of days, and the pain diminished somewhat. That was suffering. It was real suffering. You guys go through real suffering. But I want to make a distinction. That was not gospel suffering. Gospel suffering is suffering that comes as a result of doing gospel ministry. Okay? So the question is, is there evidence in your life of suffering and endurance because of the gospel? Or are you coasting satisfied with your comfort? And I think this is a battle, friends, that we have. We are more concerned about our comfort, and I'm speaking about myself, more concerned about our comfort, more concerned about uh, our our world being satisfied rather than living life in such a way that we're willing to take shame, we're willing to take endurance, we're willing to take suffering for the sake of the elect. Number three, is your hope in your immediate circumstances Or is it in the certainty of what is yet to come in heaven? Where's your hope? How much do we hold on to the certainty of heaven that that gives us the fuel to live out the gospel now? I love the book of 1 Thessalonians because it's basically Paul's instructions to a church to live in light of the coming of Jesus, to live in light of the promise of heaven. To have, you want to say, one foot in heaven, but also one foot on this earth. And so you're saying, I know where I'm going. I know what is yet to come. And so I'm willing to endure. I'm willing to face things. That's hard. I remember going to the hospital a few days after I started to get sick and got the call from the doctor because we did a test and it was like, come to emergency now. And of course, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh no, what's happened? And I'm thinking of surgeries and all this kind of stuff. And you know what? I'm a wimp. I, I don't want anyone poking anything in me and going through surgery and that kind of stuff. And so I didn't want to have to endure that kind of stuff. I just wanted to get better, right? Now, similar context, as Christians, we just as soon not have suffering, we just as soon not have to endure, we just want the prize, but God calls us to live our lives as faithful soldiers, willing to endure and suffer so that the prize can be reached. I'd invite you to turn your Bibles, as we bring this to a close now, to Hebrews chapter 12. I want to read the first three verses. This is not only the end of the sermon, this is also preparation for the Lord's table. 
Because the last thing I want us to consider is this. Remember, this is all about remembering. Remember Jesus Christ who suffered and endured what we deserved. He did that for our salvation. Listen to Hebrews. I'm reading from the New Americans. It's going to be a little different. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, speaking about all the example from chapter 11, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Does that sound similar at all to what we're reading here in 2 Timothy? For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Friends, suffering and endurance is not a great message, is it? (laughs) So don't lose heart because you have something far greater awaiting you. Jesus did it. Paul did it. And God calls us to live our lives embracing suffering, embracing endurance with the certainty and the promise of heaven yet to come. Lord, help us today. As we contemplate the power of your word, the power of your gospel, Lord, that changed us as we were wandering in our lives, Lord, just heading in our own direction, doing what we wanted to do in various ways in this room, you have entered into our lives. You have breathed new life into us. You've moved us and, and in such a way that we are dead to self and now alive to Christ. Lord, that is only because of you. And Lord, I ask today that with the example of Jesus and with the example of Paul and the the reminder of this faithful saying that we would embrace what Paul is saying to Timothy to endure suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That we're living in a context, Lord, where we're fighting the battle for the gospel. And Lord, you're working through us as the means by which that battle is being carried out. Help us, Lord, to embrace suffering when it comes, to embrace endurance when it comes, because it's all part of your plan for us and for others to receive the prize of heaven. Lord, this is such a hard, hard thing to embrace. But may our perspective, Lord, be rooted in your truth Lord, not caught by the the foolishness of man's thinking that that falls under the umbrella of Christianity that says, oh, prosperity now is what you want when we are so clearly taught by you and your example that our joy, that our celebration, that our hope is in our future. And Lord, you certainly give us wonderful things that we enjoy now as we live our lives, but Lord, suffering is the the means by which, Lord, you've called us to minister your truth. And so, Lord, even as we take the Lord's Supper today, may we be reminded, Lord, of what you have done as you went to the cross, the mocking you endured, the the scourging, Lord, that was done against you, the way that you were uh, ridiculed by that crown of thorns. And yet, Lord, you went to that cross and you did it For our sakes, you did it, Lord, to be that sacrifice once for all. And Lord, may we come today refreshed and renewed by the reality of your love expressed through suffering and endurance so that we could experience and have the certainty of the prize that you have promised us. You call us to reign with you. Lord, that is staggering. We are not worthy of it, but Lord, we embrace it. Help us now to live our lives for your glory. We ask in your name.